Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books in Economics, a podcast channel of the New Books Network. I'm Tim Jones, and today I'm delighted to reinvite my very first podcast guest from the early days of social distancing, Joshua Gans. Back in June, he just published at Warp Speed, Economics in the Age of COVID-19, and promised us a fuller version of the book in the autumn. And here it is, at twice the length and retitled The Pandemic Information Gap, The Brutal Economics of COVID-19, published in November by MIT Press. Joshua Gans is Professor of Strategic Management and holder of the Jeffrey X, sorry, Jeffrey S. Skoll Chair of Technical Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Rotman School of Management, University of Toronto. He is also Chief Economist of the University of Toronto's Creative Destruction Lab. Joshua, welcome back to the podcast. Ah, it's great to be here, not that I've moved. <laughs> um, did you go straight back into the book the moment you f- you filed the first version, or, or was there a break? No, uh, I did. Well, at least as I recall, it was pretty much straight away. Uh, I, uh, you know, we'd set ourselves a, a fairly ambitious deadline again because uh, it was going to go into the normal publishing process, which meant that I had to get a, a version finished in a in about another month or so uh, after the first one was published. So it was really, it was really, uh, it was really a continuation. Mm. Yeah, because I, I was a, I was a bit surprised at the beginning of the book. You sign off with um, July, uh, which was, I think, you only had a couple of months after the first deadline, right? Right, right. Yeah, uh, it, it's a bit odd. I mean, I, I guess people sometimes wonder if, you know, with that first one, if I. Um, given that I had to write it, then I chose to write it so quickly, you know, what would I have done if I'd had another month? Well, I, I guess this book is that. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. And did, did you have any opportunities to, to, to tweak it uh, beyond July? A um, little bit, a little bit, but, but basically it was sort of formed after that. And, and uh, you know, uh, it started to, I started to realize when I wrote the first book, it was really, uh, trying to, you know, there were just all these economic issues and I thought I'll write a book just about the ones that I see. Uh, I wasn't going to attempt to come up with any brand new thesis or, or, or anything like that. But during the course of writing that book, uh, I came to this idea that the way to look at uh, COVID-19 as, a you know, the pandemic was... Uh, one way to look at it is, is it's a health problem, and of, and of course that matters for anyone who is uh, getting uh, ill from uh, this disease. Uh, but the the broader way to think about it, and maybe to think about any pandemic, uh, especially for the rest of us, is as an information problem. Is that the reason we we're all feeling some sort of mostly economic and social pain as a result of the pandemic? was because we were all forced to be treating ourselves and other people as infectious all of the time. And that if we could uh, come up with ways of identifying who are the really risky people uh, and isolating them, then the rest of us uh, would be far, uh, would be able to go more about our business. And you could really minimize the uh, economic costs associated with this, not to mention uh, also maybe controlling the pandemic itself. Yeah, uh, you make this nice point, actually, um, I think in the first chapter where you talk about, uh, uh, you, you, you make this key point about information being being central to, 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 the, to the problem. And you said that uh, even... Even the uh, even the vaccine is an information issue. You, you say, uh, "quote uh, We outsource the job of managing the information problem to antibodies that identify and kill the virus should it enter the body." That's right. <laughs> I, 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 you know, that was a that was a brief moment of, of. I wonder if I could have a grand unified theory of this all the way to the molecular level. Um, <laughs> and I think there is something to that. Um, I found it you know, at the time reading about how our immune system works, 
is very similar to what we are trying to do with regard to people. That is that the immune system tries to target these foreign invasive uh, things uh, and neutralize them. And it, and, and, and it does so well when it doesn't neutralize everything else. <laughs> so one of the reasons this disease gets out of hand and, and becomes deadly for people is because the immune system uh, loses its ability to pass that information and starts, because it's uh, lost control of it, starts to kill everything. So there is a, there is a uh, you know, I don't know if it's the same thing or a metaphor or whatever, but there's some principle going on. <laughs> well, in your second chapter, um, Health Before Wealth, you, you challenge, I think we talked about this last time, but you, you challenge the very foundations of, of the perceived dilemma facing governments during a pandemic. So the, the idea of the classic trade-off between, as you put it, an extra bit of public health leading to a bit less economy. Can, can you talk us through that, uh, that issue? Yeah, so that was something that, that was one of the very earliest things that I grappled with back in March because I realised, you know, with this virus sort of starting up and, and really quite, you know, low numbers relative to what anyone would experience, it, it, it didn't take a genius to work out that some good fraction of the population was going to say, do we really need to be shutting down the economy for all of this? And, um, and you know, to point out that we don't always shut down the economy every time we've got a, a virus going around. Uh, we, we sometimes let it run. So, there, there, you know, you can't ignore that there are some, some issues there. Uh, but the real uh, kicker for me was uncertainty, and, and it still is too. It still is uncertainty, um, is that you just didn't know uh, at the outset um, how deadly or other health consequences, you know, the long haulers and other things that are coming from uh, getting COVID-19. You didn't know how serious all that was. And, and, and you were also faced with a second problem, which was you were unprepared for even the modest amount of illness that might come in terms of hospital capacity. And so uh, you, you take that fact and then you also add to it something about the way pandemics work, which is you can do a lot of activity right at the start and actually control a pandemic uh, quite well. Um, and in previous pandemics, like SARS and MERS, that's kind of what had happened. Um, but once you let it out of the bag and it sort of starts to seep too far into the population, you don't get to roll it back. <laughs> you don't get to, to, to reset. So if you don't know of how deadly this thing is and you have an option at the beginning to sort of uh, pause everything, lock it down and then and, and find out, uh, that seems like the better way to go. And so that was the argument I, 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 I made uh, in, in that first book and, and I continue to make because it it's, it's still, still holds. What's really, uh, I, I, I must admit, by the time I got to writing the, the expanded book, I thought this debate was over. I thought people had pretty much decided um, we agree we have to deal with the public health crisis and um, we shouldn't lift our, uh, you know, lift our eye off that ball. Um, but it's kind of interesting. I saw it play out in a few places. Like in Australia just recently, uh, they had an outbreak in, in, in Melbourne um, uh, that was, you know, threatened to sort of become the bigger uh, outbreak. And then they decided to lock down for almost three months. And there was a hard lockdown. It was quite a lockdown that had business closed and curfews and other things like that. And during that time, uh, you should have heard, you know, the debate about, oh, this is not worth it, this is too much, this is blah, 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 et cetera. Uh, and then just last week, they finally lifted the last the lockdown. And people in Melbourne, they're living normal lives. <laughs> you know, I went on a Zoom call with some policymakers in Australia, and, and, and at the other end of the Zoom call was a group of six people sitting in a room. And I was like, well, that seems weird to me. 
<laughs> it was crazy to me. But the reason they, they could get to that because they did that, they had it came off a really low base and they will just able to slap down that outbreak. And now they can spend the next few months being normal. Whereas, you know, for the past eight months, uh, you know, here in Canada, which has not done terribly in managing this thing, you know, nothing's been normal. We're, we've all been <laughs> isolating and, and and doing things for a, for a long, long time, and, and look like doing so still. So that d- debate still rises. It's not been won. And then in the United States, in particular, uh, during this election cycle, they're they're still having that major argument about uh, is it worthwhile to actually control the pandemic or not. Um, there are other aspects to it now. One is I I think it's a bit of a false choice because I think people uh, take their own um, safety into their own hands. And so whether you have a government lockdown or not doesn't tend to matter for whether people go to restaurants a lot or travel or things like that. They do. They don't. (laughs) They don't do those things. So um, it's it's a fascinating debate. It's it, I thought it was going to go away, and it still seems to be with us. So, there what, you go. What, what do you think that the the rare authorities that have done it aggressively, like the authorities in Melbourne, for example, what do you think that they have been able to do in terms of communication and keeping the, the population on side that other people have not? What what skill set did they exhibit to to, to achieve that? None, none. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> I no, no. Truly, I, I, I think. I there are sort of two sort of broad countries in the world in this pandemic. Um, I call them Group One and Group Two. Group One are countries who are have been able to, uh, when they choose to do so, get the pandemic down to virtually nothing, and resume subject to forget international travel, but within their borders, normal lives. Uh, And uh, those countries include, you know, most of East Asia, South Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam. They include, uh, they include Australia and New Zealand um, who did have lockdowns twice in each case, but those lockdowns were from a base that allowed them to, completely stamp out the virus, which has not happened elsewhere or elsewhere people haven't kept it going long enough to to get all the way down to zero or have had some other issues. Like if you're Italy, you're too embedded in Europe. So um, it's, a, it's a little bit harder. Um, so those group one countries, uh, you know, can, can do this. They can, they can get to normal. That doesn't mean they're without the virus. The virus can slip in. But they can't, you know, normal policies can be applied, uh, and especially if they're done so with resolve to sort of bring things back to something closer to normal. Then there's the Group 2 countries, which include Europe and and North America, uh, and South America for that matter, where the pandemic sort of like is all through the population and there's no amount of lockdown or whatever that would get it to zero because even if you locked it down, it would still spread within households and then seep between them and, and other things like that. It's just too prevalent, I, uh, it seems to me. Um, and in which case you're sort of just living with it. Um, and that would require a sort of different set of policies, a, a much more expensive ramping up of testing and other things like that to, to be able to deal with it. Um, and what's interesting about these countries is that, you know, the group, uh, the group one countries have stayed group one. The group two countries have stayed group two. There's no group two country that's transitioned to group one. Uh, there's there's China that was had a problem, but it has actually managed to <laughs> get itself into a group one country. Um, there's Israel that looked like it might fall back the other way, but seems to have had a very effective lockdown. So it's not out of the woods yet, but it might be okay as well. So there's some very interesting properties that occur here. And but you can't just relate it to competence. I I don't think if I compare Canada to Australia, I don't think that the Australian government or anything else had any more uh competence, a better plan or anything like that than than Canada did. Uh, I think sometimes it's a bit of luck that determines that draw. 
Uh, but if you've got luck on your side, there's a lot you can do. <laughs> yeah, it's what I mean. I'll, I'll talk about the area I know best, which is which is Europe. And what's been very striking, I think, is it, for the first wave of restrictions, pretty much uh, everywhere saw the government increase their popularity. The, the incumbent became more. There was a sort of rallying around the flag effect. Right. The second wave is a very different story. And if you, yeah. if you, uh, and it, in the UK, in Italy, even in Germany, uh, the it's causing governments to hesitate. And as you point out in the book, hesitation is is quite fatal in this response. Right. Uh, and it, it it reminds me. I don't know if you know the Juncker's curse, but this this some this thing that Jean Claude Juncker once said. He said, "We all know what to do. We just don't know how to get reelected once we've done it." <laughs> I mean, well, I don't yeah. think that's actually the the case. I mean, look, uh, I watched this thing in Victoria go where they decided to have this big lockdown despite not having the support of the national government really. <laughs> for it. <laughs> and uh, I think now that it's popped out the other side, I, I don't know when that election is, but uh, the, the the Premier of that state is not necessarily going to pay a political price, might get a benefit from being able to do so. And you saw in New Zealand, in New Zealand, um, they acted really, really quickly and they even delayed the election by their own election by a month. And then the incumbent who was in control of that second lockdown, um, you know, romped it in uh, with one of the biggest uh, landslides ever in New Zealand history. Yeah. So I don't think it's very, I, you know, I think people tend to think, oh, during the lockdown, people are going to grumble, blah, blah, blah. But what we haven't experienced yet, I, I don't think you have either, is what it's like to get out the other side of that with things looking good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that is a really big hit because during the lockdown, um, and, and this economist Tim Harford sort of highlighted this is, you know, we tend not to remember things where we're not doing very much, mm. and so uh, you know, you might be locked down for three months, and then you get to do stuff, and then you forget that you were doing that. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if we're going to forget this eight months or whatever. I don't know how how far this stretches, but um, it is, it, it, you know, there is an effect to that. So I, I think the po- politics of this aren't, aren't entirely clear. Uh, uh, I think, I think, uh, and the other, the really tough bit is this bit, is that what you want to do is when you see the, cra- so when New Zealand had its second lockdown, there were like nine cases or some something ridiculous <laughs> low when they did so. And people were like, oh, you, you got to be kidding me, um, sort of thing. Um, but that's exactly what re- the reaction you want, is that the time to lock down is so early that people think you're crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you, they don't think you're crazy, you've, you're too late. Yeah. Uh, has that, I mean, I don't know if that's been... The same case for you in uh, in in Canada and Australia. That what what's been very striking here, I think, is that many months into this, people still don't un- understand. Many many people still don't understand basic things like, as you point out in the book, exponentiality, right. or even simple things like what a mask is for, mm. the point of a mask. Is that? It, yeah, well, it brings us back to the information yeah, problem, right? It, no, it does. It does do that. I mean, the problem is it's, it's quite extraordinary. When you think about these second waves going on everywhere, you know, not a lot has changed for that to occur. Mm. Certainly no policies have changed. But you have everybody just relaxing a little bit, mm. yeah. <laughs> just relaxing a little bit, having a you know, that extra dinner with people, that extra, you know, visit somewhere, that extra run to a grocery store or, or you know, uh, things that you might not have been doing if you were ridiculously vi- vigilant as, as people were at some time. And and if the entire population just ticks up a bit, then all of a sudden there's just like these opportunities for the virus to spread, you know, really ramp up. <laughs> And so you get this, uh, you get this uh, second wave. I think that's what it is. And it's not like, you know, we've had gradual temperature change and other things like that which can influence this. But, you know, there's not a lock on that. Um, 
I, I, I think it's just that people just relax a little bit and, and there it goes. Well, when we talked in June, um, you, I, I was very intrigued by this idea in the book of, of, of the stop the clock um, idea. Mm. And we were in the very early days of that then. H- how do you think they have worked out? I mean, so the idea of stop the clock is you stop the economy yeah. and you essentially compensate everybody for that period at enormous fiscal cost. How do you feel it's worked out so far? Well, I think it was <laughs> – that's a really, really tough one. I think it's a great mechanism if you're thinking about your three – two to four month lockdown or something like that. Stop everything, reduce the anxiety, make people understand this is, you know, we're all just pens down for a bit. Um, But, you know, it's not a great solution if, as we are looking at now, we are are moving into years of this. Mm -hmm. And the reason it isn't a great solution is that it, it, um, it's not that, we want people to be kicked out of their houses or, 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 or lose their business because they can't pay their rent or their mortgage or things like that for a viable business. Which the principle of being able to pause the economy and then when it's all over, restart it again is a good one. The problem is that I think, you know, after a few years of this, there is change in the economy. For instance, uh, let's take air travel. After spending a year or two on Zoom, will people be jumping on planes to go to meetings at the same intensity as before? And if they're not, then it doesn't make sense to pause the airline industry, the hotel industry, and all of that in the same way, because really at the other side of the pandemic, those industries need restructuring. So that is the dilemma we're going to face. It was it was a, a thing that definitely made sense for a short-term policy. But for long-term, it's not as simple as that, I suspect. But I don't have a good answer, though, on it. It's, it sounds like you're sceptical about the idea of a, a early vaccine um, solution to this. Uh, yeah, very sceptical. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm almost anti-vax on it. <laughs> Right. Not, not really in the way that uh, – so the, here's, there are a few issues that come with the vaccine. One is history. We've never ended a pandemic with a vaccine. Uh, and when you think about that, there are good reasons for that. Firstly, it's actually hard to develop a vaccine. Um, not so much that it isn't for, hard to find candidates. But remember, vaccines have risks associated with them. We're asking you're tinkering with the body. And therefore, there are side effects, and those side effects may not be the same for everybody. And so normally what we do is we, uh, with a vaccine, we we test it, we research it, and we wait uh, for results. You can't speed up what happens in the body. You can't speed up an effect occurring. So there's that process, which we're accelerating now. Uh, so, So that carries some some risks associated with with it that I don't know how to judge. And what that means is that for anybody, most people, when a vaccine is approved, you want to be absolutely confident that the people who are approving it are are themselves confident. So any political pressure that seems to be applied or anything like that is definitely definitely uh, a a potential problem. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you've got to produce these vaccines. Um, From what I can uh, gather, it it depends what sort of vaccine it is. Uh, These can be very difficult to produce. You've got to do use all, you've kind of got to grow them. Sometimes they get grown in some sort of egg-like substance or they get, you need to get a whole lot of shark oil and and there's not a lot of shark, you know, there's sharks in the world, but, you know, where do you get all that? Um, uh, So producing, you know, it's not just 6 billion doses, it might be 12 billion doses to cover the whole population if you need two uh, hits of this thing, which is entirely possible. Uh, You know, that's, that's a big supply chain ask. That is the sort of thing that can take years to do. Uh, and then, uh, and that's even aside from, you know, how do I get that to the people? 
because I've got to worry about cold storage and stuff like that because these things have to be moved at very low temperatures and then stored at low temperatures and then administered and then kept track of and all that sort of stuff. So that's a whole thing as well. So that sort of pushes the time frame of when you can get to sort of some bit of normal way out. So even on optimistic scenarios, it's a year. Uh, and so that's pretty big. That's, you know, that's already pushing you back. Um, and then finally, uh, the vaccine might not do what you want it to do. Uh, for instance, the vaccine, you know, they're targeting the regulators at being 50% effective, 50%. Mm-hmm. Well, that means the vaccine could do a lot of good at 50%, but you'd have to be socially distancing and wearing masks and all that thing until the pandemic's gone along with the vaccine. So it's not like we can take the vaccine and we're free to go. Uh, that's not the way it w- it's, it's very unlikely that it'll work that way. Again, that puts another drain on how long it's going to take for the economy to sort of come back to normal. And then the final thing is that the vaccines come in different stripes. And this is taking me past my level of competence. But, you know, there are vaccines that will protect you if the coronavirus comes into you from developing the COVID-19, you know, disease and all the bad health effects. But that's not enough to stop you, if you get the coronavirus, from spreading it to other people. And that latter part, it's not that a vaccine won't have that, it might, uh, but they're not prioritising that quality in vaccines as they think about regulating and improving. So, and of course, you'd want a vaccine really to stop the coronavirus in its tract and stop you from infecting other people, uh, especially if there's a groups of the population you can't give the vaccine to because it's too risky. So th- that's why I'm sceptical. And so my, my message, I'd love it if I was, it's one of those things where it would be great if I was completely wrong in my understanding of that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be much better for everybody. Um, but in, in reality, I think people have to understand this because I think our energy should be, you know, we should be pushing the vaccines and that should be a parallel development. But aside from that, we should be trying our darndest to get rid of this uh, pandemic without a vaccine. Uh, and since some many countries have managed to do it and since countries have done it with previous similar viruses and, and coronaviruses in the past, that's where our, our, our energy should be put forward at the moment, uh, not, not this waiting game. This waiting game is, 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 is very worrying to me. But do, do you not think that crushing the curve, the examples of crushing the curve um, involve, um, well, they, they've tended to work on in island nations, yeah. And, they, uh, and, and with pretty draconian um, methods, which yes. can those be sustained over years? No, no, they can't. Uh, look, I, I don't know. Um, it's because, again, this is, takes me past my hmm. uh, level of competence. But if we look at what China did, China locked themselves down for several months. Then they came out and they tested everybody to try and pick up the people they'd missed. Uh, That's what they did in Wuhan. Um, And then they they got to go back to normal. It seems to me that once you, if you've decided the vaccine is not going to really happen or there's a low probability of it, and the alternative is so many years of waiting for this pandemic to run its natural course, whatever that might be, the idea of saying, wow, what if we could do a big push? What if we could say these two months, everywhere around the world is going to do a hard, let's get rid of the damn virus uh, activity, which will involve major lockdowns plus very widespread testing to make sure we get all the other cases. Hmm. Uh, you know, I there doesn't seem to be any, uh, you know, aside from the cost of it, but in, would it work? I don't, I don't. I think there's a good chance it would, <laughs> from what I've read, mm-hmm. uh, and and it's it's a it's an audacious plan, but uh, sometimes that maybe that's what you got to do. 
Yeah, I, I mean, in a way, that brings us to, to towards the conclusions of the book. I mean, in the conclusion of the book, you talk very much about this Manhattan Project idea and being prepared for future pandemics uh, yes. and, and also for climate change and so on. But this, what you just described there, also sounds like something that will require the kind of international coordination that we haven't really seen yet. Yeah, I think it would. I think it would. I mean, I think one of the things we've suffered from the United States not taking this seriously uh, is that, I mean, they're really the only player who could have leadership. I think, actually, this would be a great moment for the European Union. The European Union, as a bloc, could do this sort of thing. Uh, and, and uh, again, I'm not sure why it isn't being more aggressively discussed. Um, uh, I think but, it's uh, Juncker's curse again, to be honest. I think yeah. <laughs> everyone has reacted at the national and even regional level, similar to what you were describing in Australia. Yeah, yeah, I think that's pro- possibly the case. So, I, you know, this, again, you know, I think at some point after all this is over, this will be the discussion. Um, I think, you know, obviously the better pandemic preparation is is that we're ready for it. Uh, to deal with it as an information problem right from the start. And, and that was the playbook in, in South Korea and, and Taiwan and other places, and it, it worked swimmingly well. Uh, and I think that just has to be uh, everywhere. Uh, the other thing I think has to happen is that the, wherever this thing appears first, uh, we've got to work out our international institutions that understand that national sovereignty isn't going to cut it. Uh, these, the virus doesn't care about national borders uh, and uh, therefore it's crazy for us to care about them when fighting the damn thing. Do, do you think the, the response so far, in, as you, you pointed out, the countries that you think have responded very well, but in general the, the responses mean that the second wave is potentially going to be economically worse, more uncertain for economic actors? Uh, you know, it's it's very hard to say. The second wave is... So there's another thing. That, the, the thing that comes into this that moderates everything is that as the virus level in, in, a, in a region rises, people do become more cautious. And so it has a... Uh, you know, a, a social equilibrium that kind of slows it all down. Now, of course, that's the same thing that causes the economic distress uh, because that's people not doing a whole lot of things that they could otherwise be doing that disproportionately hits a number of sectors, etc. So that's probably what we're going to see uh, during, you know, this uh, nor- Northern Hemisphere winter. Uh, a lot more of a lot more of that. Um, I think, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know how everybody will react to that. I think, you know, here in Canada, people are used to um, hunkering down for the winter. Uh, what I don't think they're used to is not being able to do a little bit of an escape to a warmer climate for a week or two. <laughs> and so how all that plays out. Is going to be, uh, well, I, I call it interesting, but <laughs> it's not that interesting. But, uh, you know, and we still have this disruption to schools going on here as well. You know, the high school, used to, uh, my kids are in it every other day just in the morning. Uh, you know, uh, there are other, other schools. If it gets worse and the schools have to shut down, all of a sudden you've got kids stuck at home with parents and that's a whole other matter. So I think this is this is going to be interesting. I think that period will be ripe again for some leadership and say, you know, we can't keep doing this. Um, maybe we should take advantage of the summer to really try and get rid of this thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, now now this book is uh, it has been put to bed for now at least. Um, what what are you working on next? Well, it turned out actually, I, I, you know, I took about a month's break of uh, writing, and then found myself for the same reasons I was writing the book. You know, there was still a lot of issues, so I've actually been writing for the last 
few months, uh, and, you know, almost every other day newsletter with uh, other various bits and pieces of trying to understand uh, uh, this pandemic. Uh, I probably have enough material for another book if I wanted to do that. Uh, would you? Would you take a, a different a, angle? Is a JoshuaGans.substack.com if anyone's interested in continuing to read. I okay. certainly will be continuing to write. Um, uh, it seems like I can't stop, so I have some sort of odd sort of infection. <laughs> Well, uh, today, Joshua Gans and I have been discussing his pandemic information gap, The Brutal Economics of COVID-19, published by MIT Press. Joshua, thank you very much for coming back. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure.